Hello, welcome everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. How was lunch? <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. All right, I was so happy for you guys, you guys to be here. Uh, my name is Patrick Baller Monterde. I have Brian Moore with me and my boss, uh, Ricardo Villalobos, so be nice, okay? Uh, today, we're super excited. We're going to talk about solution templates, managed applications for the marketplace. So we're going to give you an end-to-end -end experience on how to go about developing applications that are going to fit a marketplace. So you can take your apps and then put them in a marketplace. So the agenda, very straightforward. We're going to do a very quick introduction about what marketplace is, the offers, uh, all the different types of offers that, that you're going to have available. We're going to review the tooling of best practices, and then we're going to take a full example, end-to-end, -end, and we're going to run through all the tooling and all the entire experience. So before we start, who, raise of hand if you have experience with ARM. OK, great. Uh, anybody has deployed something with ARM that they have built themselves into Marketplace? OK, fantastic. All right, so we're in good shape. OK. Now, optional questions. Do we do Bash? Do we do Shell? Or do we do both? for the demos? Both? Both? All right, perfect. Awesome, so let's start. So one of the interesting things that, was, that we have as part of Marketplace that gets some people confused is the fact that we have two storefronts. The reason that we have two storefronts is because we are dividing the audience. So one audience is going to be for your IT pros. The other audience is going to be for your business users. The other interesting thing that you'll see is how we manage the, what is the product experience? So for Azure Marketplace, the product experience is going to be on the Azure Management Portal. The one for AppSource is going to be on the Office 365 environments. Now, both storefronts use the same backend system. So as, as you go and become a publisher and you deploy your solutions, the backend system is going to be the same. We call it the Cloud Publisher Portal. And, uh, Brian has have a quick demo on how we're going to use the, the portal for that instance. Today's talk, we're going to be focusing on marketplace, OK? Just driving you down to on the areas that we're going to be focusing. The other uh, way that we've divided the experiences for, for the, 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 the offers that you're going to develop are by list, trial, and transact. So list, imagine, is basically yellow pages where you put, you just want to have your application be listed there. That's the experience that you want to have. The other one is like you want to have your partners uh, and, and your, uh, and your uh, customers use and test the application. So that's why you want to use trial. And the last part, transact, this is what it gives you the entire experience where you take your application, it gets deployed into the end customer's environment, Microsoft takes care for you of the monetization. They will take care of you for the lead management and the monitoring of the entire application and the life cycle of that app. Okay? For this spe specific uh, presentations, since we're going to be talking about Azure managed applications and Azure apps, we're going to be focused on a transact that provides the full experience end to end. Now, from the Azure Marketplace offers and assets, uh, you'll see on the, on the right column at the end, those are all the different uh, possibilities that you have in how to package your application on Marketplace to be deployed to end customers. You'll notice all the different columns. So everything is the same from the perspective of uh, the Marketplace experience. So the marketing, the lead management, legal documents, and support will be the same. Doesn't matter the offer type that you have. What is going to be different is the type of technical assets that you use on each one of the solutions. Okay. So for today's presentations, we're going to be focusing on, on the Azure apps, so specifically on the solution templates. So the difference that you're going to, you can probably ask, like, okay, so what is the difference between a managed app and, and a solution template? The difference is, for, is they're both the same from a structure and a technical perspective. The difference is when you have, you, if you have an application that you're going to have an SI or, or, a, or a third party manage that application in behalf of the customer, you use this choice, OK? And what it does from a technical perspective, it will create a security principle as part of that deployment. And basically, that you give the permission to that security principle to manage that resource group in behalf of the customer. So the customer doesn't have access to the resource group, that the internals of the resource group. The third party does, OK? 
It's just more options depending on what your business model and why not. Now, what's another question that we get a lot is like, okay, Patrick, so how, how do we decide which application tab will work best for us? Okay? So on this side, uh, I created a quick workflow so you can get a sense in, in how it works. So the first question is, do I want to deliver my application as a SaaS application? If that's the case, then the only thing that I have to do is basically have AD integration built into that SaaS application. Okay? The application will be deployed in the publisher subscription, and also the, the publisher will manage the monetization. So a new offer is being created today, and we're going to announce it. I don't want to. <laughs> Somebody else's presentation, they're going to do the big dog and pony show. So I'm just going to tell you that we, we added the ability for Microsoft to take care of the monetization on SaaS apps. Okay? So there is, an, there is a presentation that is actually this presentation right here at the bottom. There is, uh, Nuno is going to be presenting that. So that's on Wednesday. They're going to explain all the different types of offers, and also they're going to explain uh, what's involved from both the technical and the go-to-market strategy for those. All right, so let's go back to the, to the, to the workflow very quick. So if, it's, if you think that your app are, is going to be a SaaS app, then SaaS offers are the right thing. Then the next question is, OK, so my application, is it a complex application or is not a complex application? And by that we mean, can you fit your entire application into one VM? If that's the case, the best bet is a virtual machine offer. Now, interesting thing, we have customers that use both. So let's say that you want to have a community edition a developer edition of that application that you're building. A lot of people just use the virtual machine offer because it's more compact and it gives you the experience, the demo experience that you may want to have. Okay? The next step, if it's a complex application, you will need to choose if it's going to be managed or it's going to be not managed. And I just explained what managed applications are. So let's look at the top black box where you see uh, a solution template offer, which is so pretty. That's the best option, because it gives you the maximum amount of flexibility. It allows you to combine with other Azure services. It gives you the option to bring your own license, or you can also convert a pay-as-you-go by using the VM offer inside. Another cool thing that we have as part of Solution Template Offer is the fact that we can track the usage. So I remember I was telling you about some of the reporting capabilities. We have reporting capabilities regarding monetization, uh, regarding the usage deployment, the quality of service. We even track the errors. The, the reason sometimes the application will not deploy, we track those errors. And we have reports that can help you make your application more resilient into the platform. Okay? Now, another thing that is going to be interesting about, about this one is uh, you're going to be able to customize it the way you want it. Question about, I also get questions about the virtual machine offers, like how, how does the DAO work from a virtual machine offer? What are you saying about if I, if, if one of you pay as you go, I need to integrate. So the way it works is, is the following. If you want to, today, the way that we have, the, the, the way that the system is implemented, if you want to have the experience as pay as you go, so basically per hour type of billing, what you will do is you will create virtual machines. You submit those as virtual machine offers, and then on the solution template, you will import those in as URIs. Okay? You will connect those VMs into the templates. OK, questions so far? Question. Do you want, do you want to use the mic, please? So, sorry. so you, you mentioned the Active Directory uh, integration. So what if it's a managed application, and the application has to run as a trusted or has to run in the customer and customer domain as, as certified and has to be, you know, uh, work with AD. So how do I get a VAR to manage it? Yeah, so, so the question is, if you got it, so the, the application is, has AD integration by itself? With the, custom, with the customer um, domain, or it has to be uh, to carry a certificate, which is, has to be signed with the, with the end customer domain. Yeah. So how do I give an access to a VAR to manage it? Uh, and so, to also to authenticate the, the login. So, so the, this is a great question. So some, some, of, the, some of the applications that, that you build as managed applications, you may need to have, not, you may need to have some, some manual steps. Okay? 
So as part of those manual steps, you can basically set those up. So for example, we had some customers that the application gets deployed as a managed application into the end customer, and then there is a loop back where the third-party service will make the configuration necessary in, in with the customer to get that integration with AD. So it's not one shot, everything goes on the, it's that specific scenario. You need to have some manual integration because you're absolutely right. You need to have the customer on their side, they need to approve this principle, service principle, in order to make it work. Okay? So it's possible, but it's not the full you know, push button experience that goes automatically. Great question. All right. Now, what, there's three things that really you're gonna need for, for deploying your application on Marketplace. One, your application. Two, you need infrastructure. And three, you need to have some configuration, okay? So ARM templates are just basically a way for you to deploy infrastructure. That's it, it's very simple. It's that there's nothing more to it. It's what infrastructure do I need for my specific application, okay? So that's managed by the templates. The user interface comes where this is the experience that you want to provide to your end customers. So when they go into, into the Azure um, Marketplace portal, they will search for your app, they will click in your app, and then you will say, hey, I want my, I, this is the information that I need. I need, my, I'm, I need your email address, what password you want to use, you want to use SSH keys, you want to use uh, regular uh, passwords, do, how many VMs, size of the VMs, what geolocation you want me to deploy these things, okay? So that, all that experience is captured into the user interface, okay? And we have a way of, of doing that. The next thing is the template. As I said, this is where we deploy the infrastructure. Very straightforward. And the last part are basically the assets that you're gonna need for your application. So some applications can need, may need libraries, they need they may need uh, some configuration screens to deploy everything. You may need custom images, right? We have a tons of partners that they have their own custom images, so they cannot use really the stock images that we provide as part of Azure. So what they will do, this is where the VM offer comes into place. They will build their own custom image the way that they want it. They bring it into the marketplace as a VM offer, and then they will include that as part of the Azure Resource Manager template as a resource, yeah? All that stuff, very simply gets packaged up into a zip file. That's it. Now, the VMs don't go into the zip file, please. Don't put VMs on the zip file. The, only the URIs will go into the solution template. So from a software lifecycle perspective, we've done already one of the steps, right? We already determined what the offer type is. The second is to determine the environment information. What information do we need for this application to be properly deployed. And there's three types, we'll go over them. After we determine the environment information, then we'll look at developing the artifacts. So this is the, the templates plus the UI experience. And the last thing that you wanna do is basically deploy the package and then push the button on the portal for publishing the application. We're gonna focus on this, on the, on the artifacts and then the workflow. So a lot of a lot of customers ask us, like, hey, Patrick, how do we do, well, it's more Brian. They asked Brian that question more than me. They, how do we develop, how do we go about developing this experience, right? So, look, the, the, it's an iterative process. You're gonna, you're gonna be hitting, hitting the wall a few times. It's just the matter of the beast. The first thing you wanna do is make sure you start from a starting and winning position, right? That's why you use your Azure Quick Start templates. That's the winning position. We already have tons of templates for that. Then you want to use a, a good IDE that has the ability to integrate with Azure Resource Manager. And this is important because it will do the JSON validation, and it will do also color coding, and it will also tell you what is the next, basically, the IntelliSense experience, right? It's important because this way you're gonna move faster, right? Instead of having to go into the docs and doing all the stuff that we used to years ago. Now, the second thing is we got tooling for testing, and this is, this is pretty awesome tooling that the team, uh, Brian's team has been working pretty hard on working on that. I have to say, um, we want your feedback on the tooling, so please, if you use the tools, make sure you email us, Brian and myself, and then we'll try our best to improve the tooling as needed. The last part is the ability to review the validation put output, 
and the deployment output, and then you retry, you repeat again. Okay? So once you get your template all done, all set up, then you want to move in the UI experience, and it's a very similar uh, process. We do have tooling for that too. So uh, this one is going to be shorter because it's visual, so you, we have this tool called a side loader tool in which you declare what you want to see on the UI experience. You will click a button, and then it will generate that UI experience in the Azure portal with the different slides and, I mean, the whole thing. So you can enter the, the values and variables in there. So, now question. This is another question that we get a lot. What, what Azure services are supported? So let's say I want to use SQL Azure. I want to use, you know, I don't know, table storage, whatever. What's, what's actually supported in Marketplace? So Marketplace supports the 200 plus services that we currently have. The quick start templates are the best. Make sure you, when, before you start doing anything related to Marketplace, take a look at that because you have tons of examples in there with all the different services. It will help you immensely. Okay, cool. So now we're going to start with a, with, a, with a demo. I told you guys we're going to do an end-to-end -end demo with, uh, with Contoso. So Contoso has this award-winning portal. It's a fictitious company. They have this, and then everybody's asking for this awesome portal that they have, and they say, all right, we need to put it on Marketplace because we're going to make tons of money with it. So after doing their architecture design sessions with the Microsoft onboarding team, they decided to say, hey, solution templates offer probably is the best thing to do. Let's go do it. So we whiteboard with them. Uh, this is the, the diagram, the architecture. We decided to use a web server with Linux, Nginx, .NET Core, SP.NET. And then on the back end, we decided for, for a database server, so SQL Azure to scale out on the back end so we don't have to worry about maybe VM, different VMs or things like that. Okay? So very straight deployment. The code will go, your application will go into the VM and then in the database as ETL and, and all the different tables and why not. The infrastructure around, that's what we're going to create with a template. What we don't show here is the UI experience. We'll look at the UI experience later. Now, remember we talked about uh, the environment information as, as step number two on the process. This is important because this environment information is what you're going to be using for parameters that you're going to feed into the template to create the environment. Okay? And we have three, diff three different types. We have a customer information. We have application information. And then we have infrastructure. So you have a couple examples there. Uh, email address will be customer information. License key, uh, app username will be application information. And then infrastructure information are the fields on the bottom. Now, an interesting thing uh, on parameters, and, and Brian is going to touch a little bit more. You see I said geolocation versus VM availability. One of the things, not all the services, you probably know about, but by now, but not all the services are yet available on all the geographies. And the same happens for things like VMs, where we don't have all the VM sizes available on the geos. So a common, a common uh, mistake or a common uh, problem that, that some of people have is like they will hard code the VM size, right? So say the only VM size you can use is like you know, DS3, for example, right? Let's try not to do that. Just make sure that if you need to have like a specific VM that you're looking for, you also put a few options. Or, when you create your offer, make sure, validate that in the geographies in which you want to deploy your offer, those resources exist to make the deployment easier. Okay? All right, so a lot of people raised their hands already for, for who knew uh, ARM templates. So just the way I think about ARM templates is, for me, it's the infrastructure that I need to deploy for my applications, plain and simple. Now, what ARM allows me to do is basically programmatically create this, this infrastructure, right? So the things that are really good for ARM and the, the reasons why I like ARM is because it's repeatable. Once I define that infrastructure, every time I deploy, I know I'm going to get the same infrastructure over and over and over again. So it cuts a lot on development time. And so it's, that's the reason why we use it as part of Marketplace because it's, it's basically what allows us to deploy the entire ecosystem for your application. We have an awesome session, too, about that. So if you want to learn more about ARM 
and ARM templates, please go to this session. It's really good. Vlad does a really, really good job. So from the Contoso solution template offer. So we talk about the three different things that we're going to need, right? We're going to need the, the template, the UI, and also the, the application. So parameters allows you to define what are the variables that you're going to need to deploy the application. VM size, uh, passwords, keys, et cetera, whatever you need for, for deploying and configuring the application the way you want it. Um, so those are the parameters, sorry. The variables allow you to customize those variables, to customize those parameters and add new variables. In, so if you may need to have, for example, specific unique names, things like that for the different resources, variables allows you to get and define those in your behalf. The last two parts, very straightforward, the resources is basically the Azure resources that you may need. So on the example that I have, you have virtual network, the stopnet, the, the network security groups. And the last part is the outputs. That's more of a debugging or seeing the output of, of the application for you. Okay. And with that, uh, we'll start with the first demo. Brian, go ahead. Switch? Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. OK. So the first thing I'm going to do, and this is, Patrick talked about this a little bit, um, the quick start repo where we have a lot of samples, a lot of different things that you can draw from to, to build your offer. Um, this is literally what I do. I've been working with ARM for, for four or five years now. Um, I still come to this repo because with the 200 plus services we have, trying to keep track of what everything can do, it, it's really hard. So I'll actually come here and I'll actually go look for different things that I need to learn about ARM. Um, in this particular case, let's assume we're, we're doing our Contoso app. We have a two-tier app. We know what we want to build and we need a starting point. So I'm going to come up to this repo and I'm going to grab a couple things from the repo bring it down to my desktop and just do my dev test with those things as I go through the process. The first thing that I'm going to grab is this marketplace sample, 100 marketplace sample. And what this has in it is it has a couple files. It's the basic files that you need to go and put a template into ARM or put a solution, an application into, into the marketplace. Um, and it allows me to, basically I don't have to start from zero. So about 80% of what I need for a simple VM solution is going to be here. Um, and then I can just add to it as I need to. It saves me the trouble from having to do that from, from scratch. Um, similarly with the create UI definition file. So this is another file that you'll use for the marketplace. This is going to define the user experience the user will go through in the portal to deploy the application. That also has the basic building blocks that you'll need and it fits with this particular template so that again you don't have to start from scratch. Another thing that I'll grab from here, and there's a lot of, Patrick said there's 600 samples in here, so I'm going to search through here is this test folder back up. This has the tests that I'll run, and it's actually the tests that we run in the marketplace. So when you sub submit a sample for certification, we'll run the tests that are in this repo on that, on that code to make sure that it actually is going to adhere to the best practices, and it actually helps catch a couple common errors that happen as you span across the, the different files that are in the solution. So I'll grab that folder. And then the last thing I grab down here in the root of the repo, there are a handful of scripts. So there is this deployment script, and there's a sideload create UI definition script, which is a, a pseudo deployment of the create UI definition file. That does the step of putting it into the portal that Patrick talked about so that I can actually run through that UI and run through the tests and make sure that it's doing what I expect it to do. And then we also have bash versions of those scripts. So there's one for deployment and one for sideload. So if you want to run it on Linux, Mac, um, you can do that as well. The last thing, I don't need this for the demo, but the last thing that I'm going to point out to you in the repo is this contribution guide. And in the folder here, we have a document that is called Best Practices MD. And so this documents the best practices not only for the repo, um, but a little bit for ARM templates in general, and also the things that we'll do in the marketplace. So if you're looking at the things that you need to do to write a good template for the marketplace and also make sure that it gets certified, you can come in and read the document and go through there. We won't go through many of these. Um, I'll point out some of them as we go through it but it just describes the things that we actually look for and the things that you can do to make your solution more robust as you deploy it into the marketplace. So that's something you'll want to be familiar with. Both this document and the tests that are there, those are living, so we're adding to them all the time. So it's always good to come back to the repo, see what's, what's the latest, and pull that in. So from there, I'm going to go over to Visual Studio Code. And the reason why I use Visual Studio Code, and Patrick talked about this a little bit, but there is this extension, which is the Azure Resource Manager Tools extension. 
And you can see what the features list here, just a, a handful of things. And they're pretty simple, but it actually helps quite a bit in terms of actually writing the template. And you don't have to worry so much about, did I miss a comma? Did I miss a quote? Did I miss a brace in the JSON? It actually checks a lot of those things for you. And the other things that you'll see are things like IntelliSense. So if you're doing a template language expression, it'll help you with the parameters that you need for that particular expression. So grab that as you start into VS Code with these things. It'll make things a lot easier for you. So from there, so here are the files that I pulled down. And you can see, so that screen size okay for everybody? Good? Um, okay. This is the sample that I pulled down. So it's got all those files in there. Um, this is the test folder. And even down into the test folder, there's a readme in here. And the readme is going to tell me how to run the tests, which I still have to go to from time to time if I don't do it very often. And then the two scripts that we pulled down for testing. And I also have another folder in here, which is the copy of the marketplace sample. And so what I did is I took a copy of that, largely so that you could see what the differences are as we go through it. But there are some other differences between the marketplace and the quick start repo. Um, something as simple right now is the template file in the quick start repo is called Azure Deploy.json. That's just the way that we set it up when we set it up years ago. Uh, in the marketplace, it's called main template. They're the same thing, just a different name. And so if you see those different names, you can kind of put that in your mental model that they are actually the same thing. You're going to have the same code in both places. So that's another thing that I can point out as I go through it. So for starters, we'll go look at this template. And as we go through it, um, I'm going to point out some of the things in each section that are actually relevant to the marketplace, uh, marketplace offers. So for example, location is a, is a big one. In the quick start repo, you'll see almost all of the samples will not have a location parameter. And they just use resource group location. And the quick start scenario is um, either I take this, the file and I go deploy it myself or I modify it myself. I can do it, use it within my organization. I don't have to worry about any constraints there. Um, in the marketplace, we'll often have scenarios where um, someone doesn't have contributor access to a subscription, so they can't create a, a resource group. So they're given a resource group that they have rights to that they can deploy into. That resource group has to have a location associated with it, but they might want to deploy the application into a different location. So those locations do not have to be the same. And not only that, they may not have permission to deploy into that particular location for the resource group. So it's important that we actually have the parameter of the location come from the user. And so that's one thing that we see often is that this isn't parameterized. It's actually set as resource group location. And it makes it harder for people to actually succeed during deployment. Yes? Repeat the question. It's, it's the, the question is, what's the location related to? This is the location where the resources will be deployed. And so I'll, I'll show you that a little bit as we go through and kind of how I use that. And I actually have some debugging around it. Yeah, and so, yeah, so the question is, are there are geolocation restrictions for particular customers, like it may be in one hemisphere or the other type of thing? Um, and that's what this actually helps with. So you'll see as we get into the create UI def, there's a control that actually allows the user to choose the location. And that control actually will adhere to some of the restrictions that are available in, in, for, for a given subscription. So it actually helps with that. In the template, we want to make sure that that's passed through, and then we can actually leverage those, those features. So you can see, in this case, I've actually defaulted it to resource group location. And the reason why I do that is, as I go through my dev test lifecycle, um, this is really handy in terms of not having to specify all the time. So I can default a lot of the parameters. And then I can just work through the initial tests, make sure that everything's working before I actually go to the next step. So you'll see that throughout with a lot of the parameters. Almost all of them will have default values. And there are some in here where I actually have choices. So this is another thing that's common in the marketplace is, give people choices between different things that they may want to do for compliance reasons or just whatever policies they may have in place in their own organization. So for example, if I want to alternate between password and SSH key authentication, I can provide the option to do that. The other thing that you'll see very common in the marketplace is what we call this newer existing pattern. So for example, when, when uh, an application calls for certain resources, it might call for a storage account, it's going to call for networking, um, public IPs, users may have existing resources that they want to le leverage. Um, two common examples are for, well, actually, all three of them, um, networking, storage, and public IPs. The storage may be something they want to share, where they want to have all their diagnostic logs 
on a particular storage account rather than have a storage account for every VM they have in their organization. So that may be one reason why they would do that. Um, public IPs may be provisioned ahead of time and handed out to customers to use. So again, that will be an existing scenario. So you'll see this pattern where we have the option to say new or existing. Um, when it's new, which is the default here, I can give it a default name so the customer doesn't have to specify a name. And I can make sure that that name is gonna be unique so deployment will succeed. I can give it a type, and since this is for diagnostics, I'm just gonna use a standard storage SKU. And then the resource group name. And so this is kind of the key difference between an existing and a new resource. If it's a new resource, the resource group name is gonna be the name of the resource group I'm deploying to. If it's an existing resource, it's going to be different than that. It cannot be the same in the marketplace. And so this parameter allows you to specify that, but then I also have the default set so that this is set up to deploy a new storage account. And you'll see that same pattern with virtual network, and then the same pattern again with public IP. So there's new and existing, and again, I can give default values to generate unique values when they're needed. And then also default the resource group name again. So that's how that pattern works. Again, very common in the marketplace. The other thing that you'll likely need, uh, particularly if you're gonna do any sort of configuration, so we're gonna have a Linux box, we're gonna throw a bunch of stuff on that Linux box, this scripts folder here is what's gonna do that. I have a, a, a handful of custom configuration scripts that I can use. This sample is really just a hello world sample, but it shows you how to go grab the script and run it on the VM. When you do that, you need to specify where those artifacts are located. So there's a couple standard parameters and the scripts that are provided actually work with those parameters. And basically for this, I just default it to wherever the template is located. So wherever that template is gonna be, wherever I'm gonna host or stage that template, I expect the scripts to be stored right next to it. So I can change that, that's why I have a parameter. But in the normal case, I'm just gonna leave that default. I can send this all the way through the marketplace with that setting and never have to worry about changing it. The other thing that's part of that is, in the case where I'm doing my private dev test, uh, I need to stage those artifacts in Azure, but I might want them to be private, and I can add a SAS token to it. By default, there isn't one, because you don't know what the SAS token is gonna be, but these scripts will create one so that when I'm deploying from my desktop, even though those things are sta staged in Azure storage, they're secured by a SAS token. They're not available to the public. So the next thing I'll point out here is the Linux configuration variable, and I'll talk about this more later when we get to it, but um, remember I had the option to do password or SSH auth? Uh, that's what this is going to enable, so keep that in mind as we get down through there. And then also the resource ID. And so this is interesting because of that pattern of newer existing. So when I have an existing resource that I want to use in my template, I have to add the resource group parameter to the resource ID function, because I have to know which resource group that is in, I have to be able to identify it. Well, in this case, I can actually use that same function, that same function call for both the new and existing pattern, because I'm providing that option, and then I actually have the default value for the, the existing resource group name. So that one line will work in both scenarios. And that's one of the things to kind of keep in mind is there are a lot of, um, uh, ways to use the ARM template language so that you can do that. When you find yourself in a situation where you're duplicating code, that's a point where you can kind of step back and say, hey, what, what's available in the ARM template language so that I don't have to duplicate that code? So on the resources themselves, you'll see this condition property, and this is what enables that newer existing pattern, and you'll see it on all the resources that are in here. And this essentially says, if this parameter is new, if that parameter came in new rather than existing, then I want to deploy this resource. That condition evaluates to true, so we'll deploy the resource. Same thing will happen here on the public IP address. Same thing will happen on the virtual network. It's that simple. The one thing that you don't have to worry about, and we'll scroll down to the next place where this is actually being used, is if those things are not deployed, then you don't have to worry about the dependency. So you don't have to worry about taking that dependency out. ARM will handle that for you. If it's deployed in the template, it'll wait for it to be done before it starts this step. And if it's not deployed in there, ARM knows that it's not deployed in there and you don't have to worry about changing your dependencies. So the two things that are interesting here are one, the subnet ID, and this is referencing that virtual network. And you'll see that no matter whether this was a new or existing virtual network that we used in the solution, I have the same resource ID because I provided that resource group name parameter. And the rest of it is gonna be the same. I just have those parameters passed in. In the public IP address case, it's a little bit more interesting because I actually have three options. I can do a new public IP, I can use an existing one, or I cannot have one at all. There are three options for that one. And so this line here will actually allow me to go through that. 
So you can see here, if it's not none, which is what this is saying, so if this came in and it's not none, which means it's either new or existing, then I'm gonna populate this with the resource ID that I had above. And if it is none, I'm gonna null it out. And I'm not gonna provide anything there. And what that essentially does is that tells ARM, don't render this property at all. So it's as if you didn't even author it. So you don't have to worry about doing anything fancier than that. In the virtual machines, you'll see this is where we had the, the Linux configuration. And it's kind of the same type of pattern again. I'm just checking to see what did I actually want to do in this template. Did I want to do password auth or did I want to do SSH? If it's, if it's password, then this is going to get nulled out. And if it's SSH key, then I'll put that variable in place that I had above. And so it's a very simple way to actually go and do a, a, a conditional property there. And you'll notice I didn't have to do anything here because that Linux configuration has password true or false already in it. So even though I, wanna, I don't need to provide it in the case where I'm using a, a public key, private key scenario, um, I can leave it there. I don't have to complicate the authoring any more than that. And then the last thing that we'll talk about here in the template is creating URIs. So again, we had, this, these are the files that I want to download. These are my configuration scripts for my VM. And I had those parameters that I passed in that, that tell ARM where those files are located. So using the URI function, I can concatenate those things together. In this case, I have it in a folder and I have a file name if I want to put a SAS token on it. So if this is null, nothing's going to happen. And if it has a SAS token and I need it, that will get passed in there. And again, I can leave that code the same regardless of where I am in my dev test life cycle and that will still work. So that's it for my template. The next thing that I'm going to do, and we talked about this in the example, is I wanted to add a SQL and we didn't have SQL. So I'll show you the differences that I actually have in the template. You can see what I did to add SQL. Just to show, so I didn't have to change much that was in there. I added some parameters for login, password, and a couple SQL server settings. So I added parameters for that. I added some variables. And one thing that I want to call out here, and this is kind of, again, touching back on what um, Patrick was talking about. In the marketplace, we support 200 Azure services, what it, basically any service that's running in Azure. Uh, we don't have good UI support for every one of those services yet. And so there are some cases where you want to use one of those, but something like a SQL Server, which has a globally available name, um, there's no way for us to do checking when, they're, when we're collecting that information from the user. So generally what we'll, we'll work with you on is to make sure that you're generating unique values where that's necessary. So in this case, I'm just generating a SQL Server name. The user doesn't have to provide it. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about it being available. They don't have to worry about whether or not the, the syntax is right. I will just generate it for them. Um, Database name, that's another example I can just generate it. I know what my app is, I know what my workload is, I can generate the name, the user doesn't need to be burdened with it. And similarly, with something like the service objective, and so there will be some services where um, there are skew options for those services like SQL Server. Um, there's no control that says, hey, look this up from the user, user subscription, tell me what's available to them. So in this particular case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a happy medium, a good common ground. So for example, in my app, I know that the S1, P1 service objectives are not sufficient for my app. I want more performance than that, or I need more size than that. I need more DTUs than that. So I'm gonna require that as a minimum from the user. Um, they might wanna scale up. They can certainly do that, but because this is something that the user has to pay for, we wanna be conscious of that. So we wanna, we wanna make sure that they're, they're given the choice as to what level of resourcing they'll pay for. So this just shows based on whether it was standard or premium, I'm gonna choose S2 or P2 in that, in that application. I got, I got one question. So one of the things that is interesting about that is the use of variables, right? So remember, on this specific example, we, we build it this way because we don't have, like the unique, we need to have that SQL Server unique. Now, the web app will need to have a connection string to the database, right? So how, how do I do that? If the name of the, ser the database server gets created in the template. So the reason- I will show you. You're gonna show me? I will show you. Yeah. Awesome, okay. So the next thing in here, uh, a couple other changes we made. Um, one here was just the dependency. So make sure that we have a dependency on the SQL Server before we start doing our configuration to make sure that's available. Um, and then the SQL Server itself. So here's the resource for the SQL Server. You can see here's the server, here's the database, there's firewall rules, all that stuff is just, I just added that to the template. So I didn't have to do anything other than that. And then the last thing I added, in this case, I just put in an output, um, 
is the SQL Server connection string. And you can see that I can reference that same variable, so the SQL Server name. Now you're showing off. I use the reference function. And then I can concatenate everything together, um, database name, login, password, all of that is part of my connection string. So I can formulate that connection string, and then I can use it somewhere else in my template. So this would be an example where if I nested my SQL Server deployment in a nested template, I would output it, as I show here, and then I could reference that output in another template. Um, in this case, I could easily take this same expression, and I could go put it into my VM resource, and I could use it in the configuration there as well. So that's what I did. That's awesome. Now, everything's done, so I'm ready to deploy. Actually, let's go I'll show you the script real quick. So I'm going to deploy, and I'm going to deploy using that script that was in the repo. And just to show you a little bit about this script, um, it's meant to be very simple, very consistent in how it works with samples, particularly for the marketplace and the quick start repo. There are two required parameters that you need to provide. One is basically pointing it at a directory for the sample or the template that you want to deploy. So everything will be in a folder. You point it at that folder. It's going to look for Azure Deploy or Main Template, and it's going to deploy it for you. Um, the other thing is, is when the resource group is created, where do you want to put it? We don't want to default the location because then we end up with too many resource groups in one location because everybody uses the same script unmodified. Uh, the rest of the things in here you can change, like resource group name that's built, created when you, when you run the script. Um, you can change the name of the template file and the parameters file. You can change all those things. But if you follow these patterns, you won't need to change any of it. You won't need to worry about those, those parameters. A few that you might need to worry about, one is this upload artifacts switch. And so this is when my sample or my offer contains more artifacts. I need to tell the script to upload those into Azure, stage them into Azure storage so that ARM can get at them. Uh, we don't want to do that unless you actually want them in, in, in staging. Uh, there's another uh, switch here for just validating the template. So I won't actually deploy it. I'll just test it. And that's actually what I'm going to do in the demo just because it's a lot faster. And then there's this dev switch, which is a simple way to allow you to switch between parameter files. So if you look down here when that switch is set, we will look for different parameter files um, just so that you're not using uh, the common one that gets checked into the quick start repo. Okay, so I got a question. Yes. So can you, how many times I can use this script? Like, it will override the, the current deployment? So I'm, 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 I'm developing, I run this to test it, I go back to development and I run it again? You would think we'd rehearse this, wouldn't you? No. Yeah. I will show you. Okay. It's exciting. So the two things I need to give it, one is what, what's the directory folder type for my sample, and what's the location I want to put it in? Those are the two things that I have to give the script. Um, I'm going to give it the dev switch because I'm using a different parameter file. I'm going to tell it to upload artifacts, and I'm going to just validate the template. I'm actually not going to deploy it. So I do that, and it tells me what parameter file that I'm actually using so that I don't have to um, guess too much because I've actually had to do some debugging where it didn't do that. Uploads all those files into Azure, and then it's going to validate my template. It comes back and tells me the template is invalid. Here's my error. This is, an in, this is invalid. And that looks perfectly valid to me. So when I actually, when I was, when I was preparing the demo, I ran into this, um, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I, I went back to VS Code. I'll look at my template here. Make that bigger. Well, let's go look for that expression in here. So that looks fine, fine. All of these look fine, right? So it took me a while before I got down to the end. There was my error. You see what it is? I have an extra bracket in there. That's actually an ARM escape sequence. So if you ever need to have a bracket um, in an expression, you put two of those together, and that will give you the literal bracket after that rather than treating it as an expression. So it literally thought this was the location that I wanted to deploy into, not West US. So I'll fix that. We'll go back here and watch how easily I can run that again. That's amazing. Yeah. Again, it's going to upload all those files into Azure again. So I made some changes. It'll upload them, point the deployment at it, and now the template is valid. So I'm good to go. The other thing that I can do now. Now that I've done a little bit of testing, and you can kind of do this in, in either order, but I'm actually going to go and run those tests that we were talking about earlier. So again, actually, we'll just go back here real quick, and I'll show you. There's a readme in here. It tells me how to run the tests. And I'm actually going to run, I'll just run the template tests. So you can run 
all the tests. You can run just validate the JSON for me. You can run tests on create UI def, and you can run tests on all the templates that are in the solution. So I'll just run those. Again, I have to point it at the folder that I want to test and run that. And so it'll go through and it'll show me everything that I tested. It'll show me everything that passed, which is not necessarily the interesting part it relates to the failures that I'm after here. And so it summarizes those at the end. And it's telling me that resource group location must not be used except as a default value for the location parameter. Well, that's, that's what I have, right? So remember when we looked at this, Here is my location parameter. Here's my default value. We'll make it bigger. And I have resource group location there. That's perfectly allowed. That's, that's a, a valid scenario that we don't want to flag. And that's what the test said. Um, so I need to look and see whether or not this is being used anywhere else in my template. So I'll just go search for it. And sure enough, there's another place where I'm using it. So what I did when I built this template, I copied and pasted that SQL server resource. I literally copied and pasted it from another template, and I forgot to update this. And so that's the one that's still in there. And so what would happen in a case where I have a scenario where um, I'm deploying resources to a location other than where my, re my resource group is located, that would fail. Because it would say, hey, SQL server is in West US, and you want to put the firewall rules in East US. Can't do that. They have to be in the same location. So that's why we check things like that. So here, I'll just go and put in that location parameter. And you'll see this is one of the things that the tooling will do for you. So it lists all the, all the parameters for me. And I can just auto-complete that. If I'm going to go back and run that test again, make sure that I got them all, now it passes. So that's the main template part of the, part of the demo. So I'll switch back to Patrick here, and he can talk about the UI. Awesome. Awesome. So just to summarize the, the first demo, the first demo that we did was basically building the, the resource manager template. So we look at the, the sample template, how we picked it up from the sample template. Make sure you get your Visual Studio Code extension for ARM. We made our changes, we deployed, and then uh, we did the testing and look at some of the best practices. Now the next part, remember there's three parts, is going to be the UI experience. So we have a pretty uh, highly granular UI environment that allows you to create the same UI experience that you will get with any uh, all these services on Azure. Okay, so you have the ability of basically have uh, multiple blades. You can blades are for people who don't know what blades are. It's basically different steps. Okay, we call them blades independently, and then this is this is the code how you will see it. So. Basically, we have the ability to do uploads. We have special types that will allow you to do uploads, to put passwords in a secure way, to create uniqueness. And uh, Brian is going to go and, and uh, give us the UI that we need for, for our app. OK, let me switch. So again, I'm going to start for the create UI def that I, I took from the sample. We'll walk through some things really quickly. And then I'll show you again the changes that I made. So first is the basics blade. Now, the basics blade has a couple things on it that actually aren't defined in the template. The basic blade is the same for any solution template or anything really that's deployed into Azure, and it contains the user subscription, the resource group selection, and the location. And remember those last two, they, they don't have to agree. They can be separate. Those don't need to be authored, but they're still part of the information available to the, uh, to the template as it's deployed. The other thing that you'll sometimes see in basics blades are things that are common throughout the application. So for example, if there's just a username and a password that you need for a VM, you can put them on the basics blade. You don't need to create a separate step for that, if that was the only thing that was there. One thing to kind of point out with that is, is that anything that's on the basics blade can't open another blade. And so if you think of a text box control is just a text box. Um, but if I want to say put a VM size selection on there, the VM size selection will open up another blade, and you can select whatever VM sizes you want. That can't go on the basics blade. That has to go into its own step. And sometimes you'll run into problems where things aren't loading right, and if you've got too much in your basics section, that can happen. The other thing is that anything that's open-ended um, input that you're collecting from the user, we want to make sure that there's a regular expression constraint on it to actually help validate the, the input that the user's giving us. 
um, open-ended input into a solution template deployment is one of the most common causes of failure. So we try to make sure that we can validate whenever we can so that the, that deployment is successful. So that's the basics blade. The next one is the steps. And this is where you can have as many steps as you need to kind of go fill out all the information or collect all the information that you need to deploy your application. And this is one that was in here. So in this virtual machine, you can see this is the name of the step. And then there are a number of controls that are in there. Like so there's VM size. There's the storage account selector for the diagnostics, public IP address combo, all of that stuff is in there. And you can find documentation, all of these up in, uh, up in the uh, Azure Docs. Uh, there's links we'll have at the end of the presentation for that. So that step is there as well. And then there's outputs, and the outputs are basically taking all that information that you collected, passing it on to the template deployment, and that's what that's showing. So again, if I wanna take a look at that and what changes I made, you can see here, remember I added SQL to my application. So I'm adding a SQL config step. So this is the, the name of the step. And then these are the things that I'm collecting. So I wanna collect the username, I want a password. Um, in the case of SQL, again, remember this is one of those things that we don't have uh, direct controls for. There's a lot of usernames that SQL doesn't allow as the admin username on a SQL server. Um, so we have a regex that checks for all of those. Uh, these are things that you'll have to supply when you, um, when you author those things into your template. Similarly with the password, SQL is more stringent on the password requirements, so we have an additional regex to help with that. And then down here towards the end, you'll see that I output those values. Those outputs are now gonna get passed into my template deployment, and that will help deploy my SQL server. So from there, now I'm done with that, I can go test it. I'm gonna use this script. This is the sideload script. Um, it behaves very similar to the deployment script where you need to give it a directory. In this particular case, it's gonna look for a create UI def file right next to it, um, if you're building out a solution, you have it in a folder, then give it a folder. Um, you could also change the name of the file, so if you're working with different file names, you could change that. Um, probably the only other interesting part on this is there's a switch that says open this in the Azure government portal as opposed to the Azure public portal. And so you can have the script um, do either one there. And then at the end of the script, you'll see um, there's a URL that's created. This is how it actually gets siloed in the portal. That will get written to the console so that if you ever uh, need to copy and paste it or refresh it, whatever, you can do that. So from there, we'll go call the script. This is the folder. And that's it. And this will happen fast, but it'll write that stuff to the console, it'll, lo it'll open the browser. And then I'll see the UI. And to help me debug, I'm gonna open a console window so that I can actually see what's happening behind the scenes. So I'll clear that out so we can see. And I can go through, and this is the UI experience that my customers are gonna go through. So there's, a, we'll do first blade. These are my VM settings. And one of the things that I did in my create UI definition file is I provided default values wherever I could, even for the globally unique things. So if the user just wants to click right through the experience, they can and validate subnets. There's default values there as well. And then the SQL server settings that I added. I love password confirmation. So you can see right away, this doesn't look good. And what would happen here if I didn't have the console window open is this would just spin forever. So you wouldn't really get any feedback at all. So I can look at this and I can see there's a context here. It tells me where it found the error. I remember I, I added the SQL config, I added the SQL server um, items in there and I know that I'm passing the login through. So there's something wrong with that particular line and I'm not sure what it is. Um, so I'll close that, I know this isn't working. And then go over to that file and go down here to the outputs where I'm actually passing that. If you take a look at this line, there's a problem right here. I have a comma where I need a period. So very subtle. Without that feedback from the console window, you just know that there's something wrong in your file. You wouldn't necessarily know where. And so that pin helps pinpoint the error for you. So once I do that, I'll fix that. 
I'll go back here and we'll load it again. And now you get to watch me type my password four more times. Which I know everybody really wants to do. So clear out this, make so, it easier so to see. You're typing that. So that So while you're typing that, um, so the parameters that we put in here are going back into the template. So that means that after we're done testing or, or template, we can remove those parameters, the parameter files that we have on the directory, right? You can, you can remove yeah. them. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna replace one and yep. I'll show you how I can kind of do the deployment end to end. Okay. So there's my VM config, SQL. And you'll see right away something's different, right? No big red, red text on there. The blade opened up, I got all my parameter values. And in the output window here, what you can see is what actually is gonna be passed to deployment. This is actually the JSON that will be get passed to the template for deployment. So I can take that, copy. Take it over to my parameter files here. Mm -hmm. Do that, we'll paste it in. Okay, and I'm looking at the JSON, everything looks good here. So I can save that. And now I can go do an end-to-end -end deployment. So remember that deployment script. The only thing I'm gonna add here is I'm gonna add which parameter file I wanna use. And it was number two. So That's I'm awesome. taking the parameters that I got from Create UI Def and I'm gonna pass them into my template for deployment. This is actually what's gonna happen in the marketplace but I can do it all from my desktop. I don't have to stage anything into Azure. I don't have to put it into GitHub. I don't have to check it into source control. I can do all of this from my desktop. And so what this is giving me is that end-to-end -end test, and now I can see I've got another error. And I found the error really quickly. So I've got the SQL Server edition. So I know this is one of the outputs that I have because I asked the user for SQL Server, but it says the parameter is not present in the file. And if I look down through here, I can see, here's my SQL Server parameters that are allowed. I used addition instead of SQL Server Edition. Mm. So when I authored my template, I kind of had a mismatch between what I had there and what I had in the Create UI Def. And so that allowed me to catch that by doing that end-to-end -end test. Now there's another way that we can catch that particular error. And again, it's back with those tests. So we go here, and I want to run the tests again. I want to run the static analysis tests. And this time I'm gonna run them all. So it's gonna run the create UI definition test, it's gonna run um, the main template test, and it's gonna tell me, do those things work together? How's that gonna work? And you can see, um, I, I got rid of all the main template errors in the previous part of the demo, so now I just have create UI definition errors, and it's actually telling me the same thing. I've got this output, but it's not used in main template. So I, I thought that I was passing something through to my de deployment, and I wasn't. And this can be a little bit more subtle in cases where um, I'm actually not passing in something that I should. Because on my desktop, I had all those default values in, so the deployment's always gonna work because it's always gonna be able to use a default value. Uh, but I wanna know that that default value is being overridden when I actually hook it up in the marketplace scenario. So there's gonna be some checking between those two files to make sure that they are in sync and a lot of these uh, common practices are, are, are checked. The other thing that is in here is the location has not been output. So if I look at my create UI definition file, I'll see that I didn't actually output the location. But because I had a default value in my template, deployment was working just fine. It just may be using the wrong location and not the one that the user specified. So that's how I can actually take that end-to-end uh, -end through and, and, and actually do my testing all on the desktop without actually having, having to go into the marketplace to do any of that. Um, the other thing that you can look at um, in the test folder, um, if you look at the test files, you can see all the tests that are actually run. Um, if you're interested, it's also probably just easier to not uh, just run the tests, and the tests will tell you themselves that they describe what they're gonna do, uh, but there's comments, and it'll actually tell you what the tests are doing. So there's a little bit of feedback there if you actually wanna drill into that and see what's being run. I actually just find it's easier just to run the tests because the output is fairly self-explanatory. So from there, 
Do you want to talk yeah. about, I mean, this test, like how do they relate to the certification that we do on the back end? Yeah, actually, we'll just, I'll, go into, I'll just go into the next part of the demo because okay. we're running a little bit short. Okay. Um, from there, now let's say I went through all that. I've got all my tests ironed out. Everything's succeeding. I've run through a bunch of tests on my desktop. It works the way I want it to. So what am I going to do next? Um, I'll create the package that I need for the marketplace. So basically, all I need to do is go into this folder, and I grab the files that I know that I need to submit. I know I'm not going to submit my parameter files. I don't need those. If I had other dev test files in there, I wouldn't need to submit those either and then I'm just going to zip it up. And now once I have that zip package, I can go up to the publishing portal, and in my SKU here, there's an option for me to upload that package. And once I upload it, now I'm going to get, it's going to be staged in the marketplace. So it'll go through some initial certification. Uh, it'll go through some staging so that it actually gets out in the gallery and it's publicly available. And so at that point, you can do a full end-to-end -end test with things in the marketplace. Um, but at this point, if you've done those things on your desktop, you should feel pretty confident that those things are going to work out okay. So what I did in this case um, is I went through a case where it, it didn't work out okay. And we tried to publish. We tried to request a review and go live, and it came back with a failure. And the failure says, you've got PR comments, right? So this is the feedback loop. That once you submit for certification, we're going to run some tests um, autom that are automated, and those are the tests that we just ran. And we're going to do some manual validation of it to look for some of the things that aren't automated and just in general, try to validate the intent and make sure that we understand what we're trying to do with that particular solution or that, that part of the code. So I can click on this link, and that will take me to the pull request. So one thing that you might run into is if this is the first time that you've been into the marketplace and the first time you've been through VSTS, you may not have access to this. So you might click on that link, and you'll get a, a 401. And that just means that we haven't set you up yet. So when that happens, just open a support request through the portal, and they can get you hooked up with access. After that's done, you don't have to worry about it anymore. We're working on automating that completely end to end. We're not there yet, so that if you see that, just remember just to go request access, and we'll grant you access. So there's a couple things that you'll see here. One is this validation policy failed. And so that's one, that's the first thing that you can look at. This validation policy is those same tests that we just ran on the desktop. And I'm just showing it to you here so that you can see the same thing. So if you don't run it on the desktop and you don't catch them all there, it's going to get caught here. Yeah. And you can come and see it here. And if you don't see it here, we're going to point it out to you when, you, when you go through the certification. But you can see these are the same errors that we just saw for location, for SQL Server Edition, and the ones that we originally had in main template. But what we did is we took the, the automating tool that we have on the back end and make it available in the front end so you know what the errors are up front so we don't waste any more, more time by you know, going back and forth if, if we find the same errors. And so this is the build definition for that validation policy. And you can see it's running that same script. It's pulling it right from the repo. So we do that every time we build a pull request. So it's pulling in the latest tests. Um, so you can do the same thing yourself and actually know what, what's going to happen ahead of time. You can also take it and you can fold it into your own CI CD pipeline if you have one. Uh, we've got a couple partners that do that. And it's always interesting to see them come through with, a, with an offer because we know those tests are going to pass. We know they're going to be in good shape when they come through. Uh, so that actually helps a lot on both ends. So the other thing that you can look at here, or you'll see here, is then as you look at the files, you'll see the comments. And so the comments here will be related to things that are not only in those tests, if you didn't catch them, um, but just other things that we're looking for as we run, run through the, the template and make sure that it's going to be as robust as we can make it for the marketplace. Um, so these two here were ones that were actually caught by the tests. So there's that resource group location that was still present in there. And here's an example of something that's uh, may not be the intent that you that you in, that you may not be the code that you intended. So, for example, this is a case where I'm actually hard coding the folder in the file name here. So I actually hard coded it here, but here I used a variable. And if I go up here above, you'll see that I had some variables for those things. And so the comment was really just trying to make sure we understand: is that what we intended to do? Do we intend to use something other than the variable there? Because once that changes, or once something gets added, that's going to break. And so now all of a sudden, we had something that was working just fine, been working fine for ages, and I changed one little simple thing. Mm -hmm. I changed the value of my variable, but now I'm no longer getting my configuration script. And those are really hard to debug when you actually get into the VM extensions. So we're looking for things like that that actually help with your code. Um, there are three primary areas that we'll, we'll, we'll give you feedback on. And one is that we've been talking a lot about is the quality of service. And we want to make sure that when you submit something in the marketplace, that the customer is going to be able to deploy it. 
is if they have an experience where they come through, they try to deploy it and it fails, some of them never come back. We see that in telemetry. Um, some of them will retry and get it working, but if they're gonna pay $100,000 for this license, we wanna make sure that that's actually gonna be a good experience for them end to end. We wanna get them up and running as quickly as we can. So we focus a lot on the quality of service and the things that actually could prevent deployment from succeeding. The other thing we'll take a look at is security. Uh, probably the most common thing we see is people will put passwords and keys and certificates right into the template file. Those files are publicly available. Um, you have to know where they are to find them, but if we're talking about secrets, uh, we, we don't wanna take the chance. We wanna make sure that stuff is secure in the template. Um, and the other, the other aspect is just, are you writing really good code? Are you writing simple code? Because it's not only easy for you to debug and maintain, it's easy for us to review. So if you're writing code, you're writing 500 lines of code for something that could be done in 100 lines, we're gonna give you that feedback. Now more likely than not, we're not gonna block you from entering mm -hmm. the marketplace for that yeah. because it, it, that really is somewhat stylistic. But if you have changes that you need to make in those 500 lines, you're gonna make a lot more changes, you're gonna maintain a lot more code in that scenario. Yeah. So we just wanna make sure that people understand that those things are available and we can simplify everybody's lives by doing it. So those are the three things that you'll generally get feedback on in the, on the pull request. And, and one of the efforts that we have ongoing today is this guidance that Brian is talking about. We're gonna put technical guidelines that will describe that guidance. So basically, we're trying to help everybody to put their applications on Marketplace. So what you're gonna see in the incoming months is like more and more technical guidelines that, and workshop that is gonna help you build the best uh, resilient application for our Marketplace that you can build. Okay, so from there, we're almost done. We almost got back to the repeat, repeat point. So when you see the comments in here, um, this is a collaboration tool. So free, feel free to make your own comments. Feel free to make comments to your teammates. Um, feel free to ask questions about the comments. So if it, the comments sometimes are really terse, this may be somewhat terse. Um, that's because I type a lot of them. Um, but also just for people that are familiar with it. So if you're not familiar with something, ask the question and ask it right here in line in the context. So we'll see that, we'll, we'll actually give you the feedback, we'll help us, it'll help us understand where we need to be a little bit more explicit and where we need to improve yeah. the documentation as a result. Use this tool as well as you know, it, it, any other that we, we provide. Once that's done though, you'll take the changes that you need to make, go back to your source code and your source tree, make the changes there just like we did on the desktop, go back to the portal, upload the portal, and then this will get created again automatically for you. So you won't make changes directly in VSTS, you'll go through the same life cycle loop that you went through to start with. And then once that's done, you'll, you'll come and do another pull request, we'll do another review, we'll check to see if the comments have been addressed and then um, publish into the marketplace after that. Yeah. So that's it for that part awesome. of the demo. Awesome, so we reviewed uh, how to create the, the template offer, uh, we submitted the package in the Cloud Partner Portal and then we show you how to do the, the, the review feedback. We have all the resources that we show you today are here. They're gonna be part of the slide. So this shows you the locations of every single uh, document and every single tool that we have. Uh, in addition, you have the, the Azure Marketplace support DLs. So this is where you can get support uh, from folks in my team and then from folks in, in Brian's team. PA we Butler's not on there. It's not, yeah, not directly. P PA, PA Butler is another one that you wanna remember. PA Butler's my alias, yeah, okay. so feel free to email me, it's okay. <laughs> The last part is we have three more sessions uh, for Marketplace, so please go uh, see them. Uh, the one in the top was already, already happened this morning about Azure Stack. Uh, my peer, Eric, uh, takes care of the, of the Azure Stack onboarding. He did an awesome job this morning. Uh, you got two other sessions that I highly recommend you go see them. Uh, one of the first, the one in the middle, that's gonna be ARM, so this is gonna go deeper into ARM templates, best practices. The bottom one is the one about Azure Marketplace the offers, the go-to-market strategy. So please go to those, and then you will get the 360 for Azure Marketplace for uh, build 2018. With that, we're gonna open it to questions. Yeah, no, I was just, I was just saying, I mean, I was, I was somewhat joking when I said PA Butler, but um, in all fairness, yeah. it was, if you guys are trying to get into the marketplace yeah. and you need help with something, yeah. do feel free to reach out to us. Yeah. So um, things are growing really, really fast and it's hard for us to keep up just in terms of the automation and process we wanna put into place. Mm -hmm. Don't let yourself get blocked by some of that. Yeah. If, you, if you've gone through the links, you've gone through your due diligence, you can't get past support, whatever the reason is, um, email one of us. So it, PA yeah. Butler, if you didn't see yeah. all the demos, I'm B more. Um, send us email, we'll try to get you unblocked. That That's also right. gives us feedback to know where we need to improve the process docs or whatever. Absolutely. 
So that it kind of works both ways when we can we can help each other. So yeah, and then from there, you guys have questions? Yeah, we got five minutes for questions. Use the microphone, please. That would be awesome. Hi. So Hi. is the only way to publish to the portal right now to go through the portal, or is there a way to set it up? So we've brought all those tests into VSTS so that our solution template goes through that process awesome. before we package it up and put it in the portal. Uh -huh. Is there a way to just upload it to the portal from VSTS? There's an API. There is an API. I'll, well, I'll check on that. Cool. Let me, see, let me see. There's an API. We're building an API for Marketplace for Automation. I don't know the full end of capabilities yeah, yet. You, you can do that with VM images. I'm not 100% certain if you can yeah, do it with packages. Template. I think so, but okay. it, we can find out for sure. Yeah, we can find out. So PA Butler at Microsoft.com, shoot me an email. Perfect. And, and I'll get you the answer. Awesome. Thanks. That's a great idea, too. Good job automating that process. Very Hello. smart. Uh, you touched briefly on uh, pay-as-you-go um, as a deployment option. Are there enforcement mechanisms available for that now to where like my product can assert that it's running on a pay-as-you-go instance and hasn't been you know, cloned? Yes, we do. So the, we, have, we have the ability for that. Matter of fact, you, can, you cannot, like let's say, you deploy something on a customer subscription, they copy that VHD, and then they try to run it. It will, it will get blocked because they, it's, it's tracking that internally. So yes, we do. OK, great. Thank you. Thanks. That reminded me of a different question. All right. uh, so if you unpublish something from the portal, yes. is there a way to know which of your customers are still using the existing image? So we just, we just ran into an interesting issue this past weekend where a customer contacted us and mm -hmm. said, hey, we tried to mm -hmm. uh, upgrade and move forward to a new version of your software, but we noticed that you've, you've changed the publishing option. And so we can't even make a copy of the existing machine we have to do an upgrade test because the image is no longer available. So uh, there, there is a way. So if, if, the, if the application, if, this, if your offer is continually running, you can track them because that's part of the billing. So you will see which subscriptions are actually being are utilizing your offer. OK. OK. If the, if, and if they delete it, then it's game over, right? Because they're not going to be able to re instantiate right. it. So, so yeah, you can. And it, sh it should be available on the reports. OK. Yeah. I'll look again. <laughs> All right, so two minutes, okay. any more questions? Don't be shy. We answered everything in 75 minutes. <laughs> that was our goal. Well, thanks a lot. Okay. Really appreciate your time. Minutes. Have fun the rest of, uh, of Build, and I'll uh, see you guys on the sunny side. See you in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. or in the marketplace. <laughs>